Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane. We're here each week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And it is the peak of winter, so January is the most miserable time for gardens, but there's a lot of things you can do outdoors when the days are bright and light that are important to the landscape. And and pruning is one of those main things. This is your month. We kind of wait for pruning until after the new year. So January through March is our peak window for pruning. Really, by the middle of March, you should be done. There's a lot of time to do this. I've got All my perennials are pruned. They're done. So those are the flowers that come back out of the ground. They're hibernating under the ground right now. They'll come back as soon as the the soil gets to a certain temperature, typically about 45, 50 degrees, and all of a sudden they will take off with new growth. Then they'll start blooming the end of March, April, May, June, July, and they just keep going. Uh, I've noticed that when I pruned back several of my perennials, they were already growing. Even though we've had some several cold cycles, they're already coming up emerging. So my mums, they were already starting to grow. Asters, already starting to grow. Uh, Parsley, starting to grow. So they like this uh, midwinter. They're okay with the middle of winter starting to grow up. They won't bloom yet. You know, uh, mums, they don't bloom. Asters, they don't bloom until middle summer. They typically bloom then, and then they'll grow some more and they'll bloom again in fall. That's we've got such a long growing season in the mountains of Arizona that you can get a double bloom out of many of your your mums, many of your perennial flowers, galardias, uh, Jupiter's beard uh, or or centranthus. That was also starting to grow. And so it's a nice evergreen perennial that just looks good. Uh, gopher plant or or gopher spurge. Uh, it's a euphorbia variety. It's already starting to grow. So it's, it's warm enough. Uh, that uh, that it's starting to go as the days get longer. So right now we're adding about seven minutes every day to the length of every day. As the daylight gets longer and longer, uh, the days will become brighter. They'll start to grow more, and the days will become warmer. And so you'll find that that plants just start taking off. Many of my uh, 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 cherries, apples, plums. I was doing a walk through with some of my fruit trees, and the buds on those are huge. They're really starting to plump up. This is going to be your flower bud for next spring. Well, it's important to get those that shape, that form of that plant um, opened up so that air and light can get through the center of those trees so that as they do start to set fruit, we don't rot them. They, they've got enough. Uh, it's, it's important to open up get those crossing branches opened up, get that thing open so that the plants can load up with fruit and you can harvest that summer through fall of next year without the disease and bugs and those kinds of issues. So we're doing all that pruning right now. And I don't want to spend the whole show just on on pruning techniques, which I could. Uh, I want to focus on more of the the, the 30,000 foot level. What should you be doing to get done, to get ready for spring? Uh, that's pruning's one of those. Prune back those fruit trees. I would say hold off. I try not to prune back my hedges. That's one of the last things that I prune back, mainly because you get this big uh, photinia, juniper, uh, uh, catoniaster. You get these large hedges, euonymus. Uh, you prune them back now. They're not going to grow for another six to eight weeks. I want to prune them back just before they start to take off the new growth. Otherwise, you've got, you've got to look at those pruning cuts. Some of them are rather large oh, for, for the next two months. You're going, oh, wow, I wish I'd waited on that. They look butchered. I'd wait. And there's not a lot of, you don't have to rush into this. I do want to prune them back and shape them so they don't take over. I mean, let's face it, small children, dogs, they've been lost in a Photinia hedge. They just get so massive. Butterfly bush, they get so huge. I'll wait on those and prune them back towards the end of February, March. That's when I'll prune those things back. But I'll slowly. Every week I want to fill up the the trash cans that the city will pick up and haul off for me. Uh, That way it saves on chipping and that kind of stuff. Anyway, I don't have a burn pile, all that stuff. 
I would just every week I fill it up and I go, okay, that's enough for today. And then it it uh, doesn't wear on me as much. So, but the perennials, they've all been pruned back, uh, shaped up. Many of the smaller shrubs have been done. I've done many of the trees, not all of them. I've got uh, I've got to clean up a few more, uh, but to the fruit trees, I still have to do. So I've got some time on that. I'll do all the pruning. When I get all done, I'll probably be done by uh, the end of this month, maybe middle of February, so in the next three, four weeks. I'll be done with all the pruning. When you get done, it is in Important. I can't emphasize this one enough. You want to spray the entire yard down. I mean, all the trees, all the roses, all the shrubs, all the just spray everything. Hose it all down. You're going to clean it up with all season spray oil. This is a light grade oil. It's it's organic. It's, it's the safest stuff you can you can spray out in the yard. It's also the the, the least expensive. But it's also highly effective at getting rid of any eggs that might have been laid last summer, last fall, that will hatch and come back and eat your plants. I spray the focus. I really focus on the, the, the base of the plants because a lot of those aphids and thrips, uh, spider mites, they're actually in that leaf litter or underneath the surface of the soil at the base of those plants. That oil gets down in there and kills off. It coats the eggs and suffocates them. Or it gets the uh, uh, the insects that might be there that are hibernating there. It'll it'll strip off their exoskeleton, so they dehydrate basically. Uh, so I want to clean up the yard with that all season spray oil. It's a hose in sprayer. You're going for quantity. You just want to hose down everything till it's dripping wet. And then I'll fertilize right after that, and I'll use the fruit tree spray, fruit tree uh, uh, fertilizers. There's a seven um, uh, six four four seven fertilizer that, I, that I've created for things that bloom and fruit. It is excellent, completely organic. I'll, I'll put that out there so the plants will plump up those remaining leaf buds and flower buds so I'll get a better show, a better coverage, larger leaves next spring. Uh, and it's really important for things that, that are edible, that fruit. That takes a lot of energy. A lot of, of nutrients really create a large apple, a, a, a delicious pear, more cherries. You're going to need some food for those. If you don't do that, you're going to have smaller, more, you have more pits in your peaches than you ever wanted. You want more flesh. So it takes some, so it takes some real serious food to do that. That 6447 fertilizer, the 7% is calcium. So I, I, I know that we're lacking calcium in our, in our soils here. And calcium is what brings out the flavor and the size of plants, of, of fruits especially, more fragrance in flowers. If you want a better lilac, you give it more calcium. So instead of adding a, a bag full of gypsum out there, I just combined it into the fertilizer. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. A lot of folks are doing multiple steps in their yard. I just said, to them, why don't we just create a fertilizer that's got it all in there? Why, why do we have all these different products out there? So I created a 6447 fruit and vegetable food. It also, I put it on my things that bloom in spring. So for Scythia and quince and lilacs, all those, all the fruit trees, uh, all your, your clematis, things that bloom in the spring, I'll put it on those. The rest of everything else, the evergreens, the hedgerows, the everything else, I put the 744 all-purpose plant food. It's more cottonseed meal, it's, it's all natural. It's got a little more sulfur in it, some more some iron. But it makes the evergreens really happy. But that's what you do. Pin, finish pruning. Then go ahead and spray everything with the all-season spray oil. Bonide's got a great one out there. And then go ahead and fertilize the entire thing. You really want to get this done by yeah, the end of, end of February. So you got plenty of time. There'll be a storm or two that comes through that slows us down. But you know what? You want to be inside warming your bum by the fire, having a cup of hot chocolate and some fresh baked cookies. That's a sequence you have. you got a couple months to get all that done. Got a lot in store for you. We've got Lisa Watersline coming in the studio right after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. 
Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and orderless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. Uh, Your host, Ken Lane, with my lovely assistant, the loveliest assistant, (laughs) controller of my life, my wife, my business partner, the mother of our four children. (laughs) And uh, she comes each week and just answers garden questions. And so this week was, or this last, what are we, to, midway through January now? I, don't know. I think it's February, right? We just got back from <laughs> Key West, and so you lose track of time when you're on an island or a key. <laughs> so it's kind of, the family uh, got had a family reunion over the holidays between Christmas and New Year's, spent New Year's over in uh, Key West, and... Just got back this week, mm-hmm. kind of relaxed. I wish I could show off. You need to visualize this tan we have. We're just <laughs> glowing through the microphones. <laughs> that we don't have. Uh, well, we better, a, better than most. True, true. There's a little bit of color to us at this point, but not like a summer tan. But you're still out there in the sun, but you're just not tanning. Oh, is the sun maybe you like should put sun less, sun, a different less sunblock. <laughs> and we spend a lot take of longer. time in the sun. That's true. Yeah, I don't know if the humidity. I mean, we have a it. we have a houseboat on Lake Powell, and so there in midsummer, you better have sunblock and you better reapply every forty five minutes, or you will scorch. And you tell your friends that come to visit to right. do the same, and they go, eh, "That's not going to happen to me. I never burn." And they go off looking like a lobster. Mm-hmm. You think in those terms, even with with winter hours yeah. on a beach town. So you're laying out there just soaking up. I don't relax well. You you do it better than I do. <laughs> So to be out there and just no agenda. You were pretty relaxed. I was. This trip. I have to say, I we were like, "Hello, Ken, <laughs> Ken, are you with us?" Ken? I still have PTSD. PTSD. What PTSD. is that? PTSD. Whatever that is, I don't. I didn't know it was that, but but a father raising. Four kids, big family, providing, going off on trips, making sure we get there on time, all the deadlines, making all the connections. I didn't have to do any of that. Our son had to take care of that. <laughs> our, our My brother-in-law had to take care of that, but not me. Our kids are launched, and it was so nice not to have to be responsible for anything. Yeah. I could relax. Yo, you relaxed. You were checked yeah, out. Yeah, I like it. We got to go back. Eh. Or I think I like the Yucatan better. I think I like... The further south islands and beaches. I love Key West, but it's got an East Coast flair, which is interesting. I'm not an East Coast guy. I'm a West Coast person. It's a different yeah. personality, different culture, which is interesting. What I didn't like are the mosquitoes. Oh, yeah, that's true. You Plus should not have to chiggers. deal with mosquitoes. I got a chigger in a place that should not <laughs> have a chigger. It's crazy. <laughs> I couldn't believe the mosquitoes. I thought oh, it'll be okay. It's winter. The first yeah. night there, we uh, we, we, we got weren't ready. Eaten alive. That's Western folks coming from Arizona. We're not uh, mosquitoes are small if there are any, and then they're 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 like drone size. Sheesh. And then yeah, that's anyway. It's nice to be back to Arizona. I'm happy to we be. We left back. at 15 degrees. Went to 80 yeah. degree Key West. Came back and it was. I think 50 degrees when we landed. It's yeah. kinda, we got past that storm, which is it's, good. It's beautiful. I have to say, I'm an Arizona gal. Love to travel, but I am an Love Arizona gal. Yep. <laughs> so what garden questions do we have? So we should get some garden content in. Oh, so sure. What's going on? Donna would like to know, how much soil prep is needed for wildflowers? 
In the past, she's thrown out wildflower seed and has not been successful. Yeah, yeah. So she wants to know, maybe she needs to do more soil prep. We, we, so we've got a handout on that. It's free, come in and get one. But it's, it's not a lot of soil prep, but there is some. And it kind of depends on where your house is. If, you've, if you're in these open track uh, subdivisions where they came in and bulldozed the entire area, there's literally no soil left, you'll need to do more prep than, let's say you're next to the forest and they they, they backhoed out the, the footers for your house and there's still some, some topsoil there and you can do less work. Here's what it comes down to. You need to rake off the debris that's there. So if there's rocks and sticks and weeds, you need to take a stiff tine rake, stiffer the better, straight, and just start raking the area. You're going to open up the soil so it will receive the seed and... It will get rid of the the rocks and stuff that bake the seed so they can't grow. And it, it, when you open up that soil, it will also hide the seed. Many times, you throw the seed out, you prepped it, but then you threw the seed down on top of the soil, and the birds, the birds came in, <laughs> and they've got an appetite in January, just like you, you, January is the time to put wildflower seeds, but it's also when the birds are hungry. So you kind of need to hide those. And so opening that soil up, if you've got an area that's just all the topsoil is scraped off, there's no viable living thing, no microorganisms, no mycorrhizals, no worms, there's nothing in your soil, there it's very beneficial to add some mulch, some compost, some organics back into that top layer of the soil. It'll keep the soil from compacting back down. And it'll add some vitality when those roots start forming. It'll help them get further deeper into the into the soil. I would say scarify it, then open up the soil, rake it, uh, put your seed down. What I do really is I'll take a wheelbarrow, I'll put a bag of premium mulch. So we've got a, a premium grade compost uh, screened down to quarter inch minus, very fine. Put it in a wheelbarrow, add your seed to that and mix it, blend it together. And now you can spread that. It does two things. One, it adds some organics. Two, it helps you see where the seed goes. Some of these seeds are so small, you you can't even see them. And so you'll spread them by hand and you're going, "Did did I do it? Did I not? The mulch helps you see where it's going, and then it hides it from the birds. It keeps it, keeps it moist. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to that. And then you're going to water oh, every couple of weeks or so. Keep the soil moist but not crazy wet. And then you'll start to see them come up. Oh, the end of February, March, they'll start to, they'll start to emerge. And if it's a good wildflower mix, and we make our own here, we, make, we blend our own custom mountain varieties if it's a good mix they'll come up in waves they don't all germinate at once though a certain variety will come up and then the next and then the next and so you get this pulsating waves of color that will come up in your mountain wildflower gardens which is preferred mm-hmm. and doesn't it usually take at least a year or two seasons yeah. to really get a nice full uh, bed going the picture that they sh- that they take of this particular <laughs> mix that is two years out. Always the second year is the best show. The first year, you'll get some flowers, but you'll get a lot more top growth. If it's a good perennial mix, perennial flowers take two years before they actually bloom well. They need their roots first, then they'll come back with the flowers. If you've got a bunch of annual mixes in there, yeah, they'll show really well the first year, and then they don't show well again. So that's those are the cheaper varieties of wildflowers. They're all annuals. So they look good now, but not, not again later. You really want to put in a good perennial variety. So you do it once, and the seeds keep coming back, coming back, and spreading throughout the yard. That's a good wildflower mix for the mountains, at least mm-hmm. of Arizona. Okay. Well, that sounds good. So come in and get the sheet. That'll help. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And look at the custom mixes. We've got four mm-hmm. that we've we created for here that are just outstanding. They've just proven. We've been tweaking that formula for a lot of years. Right. These are really good wildflower mixes. Okay. Well, Aaron would like to know what to do about his willow tree. He has a yeah. large, older willow that the deer oh, no. um, chewed on. Yeah. Didn't chew all of it off, but a good portion of it. He wants to know, can he save it? And if so, what should he be doing? Yeah, so the deer, they do two things. One, the, the, the bucks will come in. And especially when they're in rut or they're coming out, they're really aggressive, and they take those antlers. They've got new antlers coming out, all the velvet. They'll use their antlers. They'll use the trees to rub off the velvet off their new antlers. Okay, that's probably not it right now, but that can happen. You'll see a bunch of damage mm-hmm. on aspens, apples, willows, cottonwoods. There's a whole series of plants that they like, they really prefer. 
Second, they, they'll peel off the bark and eat the cambium layer, that sugary new uh, wood underneath. They're using it as a nutritional source, especially when a lot of their other stuff that they really like have, have winters kind of got them shriveled up, they'll go to the trees. And so what to do? Well, first of all, get on it right away. Don't let them keep doing it. They'll girdle the tree till they yeah. kill it. So clean up that damaged area. Take a nice sharp razor blade and just kind of hit a clean wound heals faster than a, than a rough torn wound. Uh, put some pruning paint on it, some black tar, tar you're looking, that'll keep the insects out. And then mainly put a tree wrap around it. We're creating a bandage to this thing. And one thing we've had success with over the years with elk and deer is take some bird netting. Oh, this is kind of weird, but take some bird netting and just lightly wrap it around that trunk a couple times and staple gun it to the bark, and they will stop eating on that. There's something about that that plastic netting they do not want to mess with, and so it's, we've, we've prevented further damage several times with that little trick. Mm-hmm. That's what to do. Get on it right away. Don't wait. They'll just keep doing damage, and, and the tree is at risk if they keep coming at it. So that's how you treat that. Great questions this week. Uh, Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. We'll be right back. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Safe, natural, organic fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. As the days get longer and brighter, houseplants can struggle and scorch, but we have the solution. At Waters, we've organized our houseplants from A to Z for the brightest of sunny locations, many even bloom. With experts that know plants and how to make them grow. Shipments of the freshest houseplants in town have just arrived from A to Z and ready for a bright new home. Waters Garden Center, where people who love bright green houseplants, they love to shop, found in Prescott. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. May I just give you my one, the one pet peeve I have when I walk neighborhoods. I go out and do consults. Uh, for, for friends, for for clients, uh, we'll go through a neighborhood, and this tree that obviously was planted like five years ago still has stakes on it. The stakes have actually broken off, and one of them still leaning against the trunk, but they haven't taken the time to untie that, and take it off. Take the stakes off your trees. The trees don't need it after the second year at most. In fact, it's making the tree weaker not stronger. It's not doing your tree a favor. You really do need to take these stakes off. Not only that, they're ugly. You got these three foot, three inch lodge poles sitting there on either side of your trunk. It's bringing you down. It's dating your house. It makes it look like you're... Anyway, take the stakes off. So here's what the general rule is. So what we advise folks, we're coming out to plant a new tree in your yard. So we've planted several maples and a spruce, some pine trees. This this week alone, the crew is out installing some plants for folks. We'll tell them, uh, we'll stake them for them. It comes with the service. It's included in the price. We're going to stake these trees. Keep it on this year. If we're planting right now in winter, we'd say keep it on for one year. Next winter, take the stakes off. The tree, if it's truly happy, will flush new root growth. And right after that, it puts on a new cambium layer, a new ring of wood around that plant that makes it stronger. You want that plant to bend and move in the wind. And so we'll take two stakes, put them on either side of the tree, and we'll tie it just once between those two stakes so that it can move. It'll actually move in the wind, but it won't lay over or or bend down to the ground. For evergreens, we're putting two stakes on so that if we get a heavy snow, and we will, 
It won't load up on that surface of that spruce tree or pine or fir. It won't load up and then fall over. So literally the plant like on uh, Arizona cypress, they'll, they won't come out of the ground, but they'll lay down the ground. Well, you keep it on for one year, and then after that new ring of, gr- of wood grows on that plant, it'll be strong enough to hold up by itself under almost any kind of weight. That's important for Deodor cedars, Arizona cypress, some of your junipers. Now, less so for spruce and pine, but we still do it. We say take them off after the second year, after the second growing season. For things that are leafy, that is a fruit tree, a, a new maple, aspens, things that are, are deciduous right now, and they're going to put on foliage for you, there we say keep it on for one year and then take it off. We want it to move and bend in the wind, and as it moves, it's like creating muscles. It creates those fibers in that tree. It strengthens them. So if you, if you put a stake right next to the trunk of the tree, that's a detriment to that tree. It cannot move. It can't move its muscles. It's like putting your arm or your leg into a cast for a year, and then when you take it off, what kind of muscle tone are you going to have underneath that cast? You're not. You're going to be, it's going to be hard to walk on that or hard to lift something with that because all the muscles are gone. You want the tree to be able to move and, and bend with, that, with those stakes, but not lay over or, or blow or the prevailing wind will come up and just it'll start leaning to the northeast. We don't want that. For fruit trees, that prevailing spring wind is it that new leaf, new leaves come on, it'll start to blow. And all of a sudden, this plant will start growing to the northeast. Now, the next year, you'll have this very robust uh, uh, peach harvest, uh, plums, uh, apricots, and all of a sudden, this tree will just lay down. It'll break branches. It'll just lay over. I've literally seen plants jump out of the ground. The roots will literally leap out of the ground because there's so much fruit on this tree, it just falls over. It's that's really happens when it's leaning to one side. You want to stake it for a year so that it grows nice and straight. Now when that fruit comes on, it will be able to hold more of that weight uh, straight up and down and gravity's not going to do you a disservice and the tree will fall over or break a branch. Uh, it's important, but don't keep them on too long. If you do that, it's just, it's not doing any good. I've, I just saw a wisteria. Wisteria vine, wisterias do wonderful, beautiful, flowing uh, purple flowers. Just every spring you can count on it. They're really pretty in the mountains of Arizona. But to get them to grow in the direction you want, sometimes you stake them. I was out there in this wisteria. It was holding the stake up. <laughs> the trunk on it was bigger than the stake. It just needed some simple maintenance. And some of your gardeners that are taking care of your plants, they're not plant people. They're mow and blow, keep it clean, keep it trimmed, and then move on. They don't know when to take a stake off, when to do it. They actually don't even know how to set an irrigation timer. They're just there to clean up and move on to the next one. Fast, fast, fast. Go to the next one. They don't spend time. You need to instruct them. Oh, while you're here this week, I hear I'm supposed to take those that broken stake off that tree, get rid of it. And so they'll take the time then, they'll grow quick, you know, clippers, take them off, break them off, and away you go. If you're not sure, what I tell folks is take the, take the tie off, but leave the stakes in. Let it leaf out. Let it start this spring. See how it does. And if it holds up straight, then break off the, the stakes. The difficult part with, with putting stakes on trees is pounding them in the ground, if you're just not sure, before you break them off, you're not, you might have to put them back in the ground. Well, hold, just wait. Just take that tie off and see how it does. You'll know by the end of April. Yeah, it's good to go. It's fine. Or uh, I better keep it on for another year. That's my tip on stakes and how to stake trees. And most of you need to take them off if they've been in the ground for more than two years for sure. Be right back. Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Arizona Gold Euonymus. An excellent choice for colored hedges and as tough as they come. This evergreen displays bold gold, head-high foliage that grows even thicker when sheared. A single shrub makes a bold statement for just $27. But in rows, they make excellent visual and sound barriers. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love bold gold hedges, they love to shop. 
Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our red clusterberry cotoneaster. Stunning white flowers cover the shrub in spring, then form red berries. A large evergreen that is tough, easy to grow, and tolerates poor soil. So thick when sheared is the perfect privacy for hot tubs, secluded entertainment areas, and prying eyes for just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love red-berried cotoneaster, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. All right, we are back with Ken and Lisa Lane, The Mountain Gardeners. And this segment we give to Lisa Waters Lane, my wife, my business partner, uh, the one I like to go through life with, but she's also a really smart gardener. And so to get her flavor, her flair, her take on gardening, what she's doing, and she's, she's basically the buyer for, she, she's the, she talks to all the growers here at Waters Garden Center. And so she knows the sequence, what's going on. She's got the the heart and soul, the pulse of the garden center, (laughs) the local garden community. Uh, You got it. So that is me. Oh, dun, Wonder dun, dun, dun. Woman, <laughs> Plant Yoda. <laughs> that's actually not good, I guess. Really, really smart, green, and ugly? That's not it, huh? Really smart and green. Maybe I'm, Skip the ugly what's part. The baby Yoda everybody's talking about? I haven't seen that yet. We don't well, have Disney Plus, so I haven't and, seen the baby And our Yoda. kids are gone. Why do we want to see a baby Yoda? I'll go to Star Wars. Everybody's everybody's talking about it. (laughs) Okay. They're saying it's a good show, but. Okay. You know, the Lego movies, which are stupid idea, but total promotion for Legos, but they're actually pretty good wit. They are. kind of fun, great plots, Mm -hmm. uh, just interesting characters that you can tell it's for little kids. And but adults. they write it for the parents as well, yeah. so it's a very interesting take. So, mm-hmm. uh, okay, there are some of those that are pretty good. You've been watching Lego movies lately? I'd rather watch a good <laughs> romantic comedy any day. You or would. a classic. Just give me a black and white I love the Hitchcock old classics. or yeah. bring on. Yeah, any of those are great. Mm-hmm. But that, that just makes, that just says I'm old. Well, uh. hey. <laughs> hey, be careful where you're going with that. You got a birthday coming up. I know. That's all I got to say. So what are we talking about besides my age with this segment? <laughs> house plants. <laughs> That's a good one. Great. Because house had plants a are fun. Huge load come in. So yeah. you're talking about your load. <laughs> <laughs> we won't make the pins. If we're going to go older age, I can keep up with the best of them. Yes, you can. We'll just let that one go. And we'll talk about house plants, which are okay. beautiful and fun and green and add so much to our homes and our lives okay if we want them to and it's time i just i just read a a a garden trend 2020 garden trends Mm -hmm. and uh better homes a garden it's this is across the board many many i mean i kind of track the garden stuff Mm -hmm. and the trend is definitely bringing the outside in oh sure uh better homes and gardens uh, they just had, uh, you know, will online uh, uh, purchases of plants put the garden centers out of out of out of business? Gosh, I hope that's not. the trend. Uh, so that's that's the story they wanted. Well, they turned it and they said, no. What it's doing is you can see a few things over here, and then that's driving huh? customers to the garden centers to see more, really? uh, to touch and feel, to see. Mm-hmm. And we are seeing that. You're seeing yeah. when when the colleges, when the dorms are filled up. There we got tons of college kids coming in. We've That's got uh, new homes from older retirees. Mm-hmm. Their house is cavernous, and they want something nice and alive. And we're mm-hmm. seeing this trend. I mean, the the uh, um, house plant sales are double what they were mm-hmm. two years ago, even. And that's not a small number. Right. It's it's double from a big number. That, that's it's impressive. It is. So that's a trend for the 2020, bringing the outside in and more mm-hmm. house plants. And I I really enjoy it for years and years i was kind of a anti-house plant person just because i felt like i killed too many of them i didn't have time so i just didn't bother with them and the past few years i have started bringing a lot more house plants in and been successful with in your house not just the garden center but your house you've been very very good yeah you know it used to be i'd have them for a week and then i'd kill them and throw them out well you're taking more t- you're doing the tough <laughs> stuff anymore too not cacti yeah we got those but some of the really 
robust yeah. house plants. But I really enjoy what it brings to our home. Just that greenness in the home, in, in our bedroom, um, just knowing that they're in there doing their job, kind of cleaning that air, being an extra air filter. Um, so it's just nice to have them. Plus, it's just, it gives you something to do besides sit and watch young baby Yoda on TV, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So it's really good that way. So so, she, so Lisa is the plant person inside our house, mm-hmm. and I am the cut flower, that's true. pretty color vase arrangement guy. I don't know what that says about a relationship, <laughs> but I like the color and style and art of cut yeah. flowers, and I'm always bringing them home. And then you are. you're the plant guru that mm-hmm. keeps the other stuff alive. And what I have found is just there's a few tricks that if, if people will pick it up and, and learn from those few tricks, uh, they can be very, very successful. And they don't have to be afraid of house plants and don't bring any plastic house plants. And yeah. you can do it without so, it. So what are some house plants that you've got in that, mm-hmm. that, are, that are here? That, that folks, listeners can can t- kind of put into play and sure. then just go, I'm going to have success. You bet. So if you're new to houseplants or you just feel like, gosh, I just kill everything, you're probably not going to want to start with an orchid oh, yeah. or a mingarelia <laughs> yeah. or something that is difficult to start with the stuff that is easy to grow. Yeah. So Sansevieria, which the other name is mother-in-law's tongue or... Goes by another one, swords or something, blah, blah, blah. But um, tough as nails. Oh my gosh, you can barely kill that plant. The only way you can really kill it is over watering it. True, yeah. Which is what most people do. So it's a very low water use plant. The other great thing about it, it can take a bright light, it can take a dark room. Uh, it's very adjustable to whatever your light conditions are. It's happy with that. You know, most house plants are like that. I noticed. Mm-hmm. You can put them almost in any room, and then if they start to suffer a little bit, they start to lay down or get a little leggy or a little yellow, they're they're indoors. You can move them to another brighter room for a week, and they perk right back up, and there they go. Yeah, definitely. So Sansevier is one. The other one that I tell people, if you just don't know, get a ZZ plant. Um, I talked to a couple the other day. They had some shelves in there. They moved into a new home, and they have those shelves you know, way up high. And they wanted to put plants up there, but they didn't want to have to be getting up on a ladder every week. And I said, oh, my gosh, get a ZZ plant. Because I water mine right now, maybe once a month. Yeah. In the heat of the year, if the house is really warm, maybe twice a month. Yeah. Uh, but it also keeps a really nice oval green, dark green foliage to it. Just always looks good. It's not like you're picking up a lot of dead leaves off of it. So it's a great one for those high up shelves. I mean, that's cheating a little bit. You've got whole house humidifiers, room we'll humidifiers. So we're trying to con- condition yeah. our air because it's where we live. So maybe if you don't have those in play in your house, maybe you it's every three weeks more. instead mm-hmm. of every four weeks. I don't know. It's, right. But yeah, super low, mm-hmm. super low water user. Definitely. And the one that everybody knows and everybody grows is Apothis. Those are the ones with the long, they hang down. Yeah. Uh, you can get them in dark green, green and yellow, green and white. They kind of few different varieties of it but there again it's another one that it just doesn't need a lot of extra you know it doesn't need a lot of extra humidity or you're not gonna have to double saucer it to make it grow so there's definitely plants you can put in of course anything in the um sedum or succulent family anything in the cactus family there's some aloe or or aloes um there's some really cool euphorbias out there um, to kind of have color to them and all kinds of different things. And those, if you travel a lot, those are excellent ones to put in because you can leave for a week or two and you're not worried about having to have someone come in and water your house plants yeah. and that kind of thing. So definitely if you're just starting or if you travel a lot, we can help you get the right house plants so you can still have that greenery and growing in your home but not have to worry so much. So now you had a pothos in that on that antique uh, plant stand that we mm-hmm. have. So that's the one that trails down. Right. And I noticed it was touching the ground, and then all of a sudden it was pruned up. Did you you nipped it or something? Didn't you? you I, just I, why did you do did. that? Well, it's, because I wanted it to be fuller up top. Oh, so gotcha. If it's it, they want to do that. They want to drape it. When we were in Florida, we saw pothos. Yeah. We took this one trail back to through through the swamps. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was scary. But there were philodendrons, there were pothos, there were all kinds of what we call house plants just growing out there. Well, they just want to grow and grow and grow and grow. But I want to keep the head of it, the body of it full. It. So I trimmed it back. So instead of trimming it, pinning it around the kitchen, yeah. you actually cut it back. To, to, to keep it, make it look fuller, mm-hmm. and it it, it does look better on the on that plant right, stand that it, right. where it's at. Mm-hmm. That that would be a better look to it. But if you wanted it to grow around the kitchen, you could certainly yeah. let it do that. Yeah. All right. Great suggestions from Lisa Waters Lane on house plants. She's here with the whole staff of experts on house plants and answer questions to show you which ones are best for your home. We'll be right back on the Mountain Gardener. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. These tulips are delicious. We're the cutest mule deers, and we just ate Mrs. Smith's flowers. (laughs) We avoid Mrs. Johnson's because she has native plants from Waters Garden Center. She's got bright red sage, sunny blanket flower, hot pink gara, and a lot more. They grow like crazy in local soil, and she hardly ever has to water them. Hummingbirds and bees love natives, but they taste awful to tear. I sure hope Mrs. Smith doesn't figure that out. Go native. Waters Garden Center. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. So I was out in the yard taking down the Christmas lights, you know, the holiday decor, all that stuff. And, and boy, I tell you, quite honestly, it looks bare. <laughs> It's just, it's not the same festivity. So it looks like wintry landscapes. If you're out there and you see that there's just some holes or you're just not quite happy, it, it is okay to plant something now. It's it's perfectly fine. In fact, it's ideal for your evergreen things, things that maybe are a little bit slower to grow. So spruce, maybe if you've got a green thumb, they might grow 10 to 12 inches a year. A pine tree, especially Austrian pines, ponderosa pines. If you've got really green thumbs, the perfect growing environment, you might get 18 inches out of them. So there's they're considered slower growing. Whereas a maple, it might put on three feet. A sycamore, four feet. A cottonwood, five feet. It's got two, three times the growth rate that an evergreen does. This is a great time to be plugging in. If, if you got that new hot tub for Christmas, and you're out there and enjoying it, soaking. It is wonderful this time of year. And, and your neighbors keep flipping on the, the bedroom lights, and they're maybe not looking at you, but just the lights coming on and off. You're going, who is looking at me? I don't know. Should I have a swimsuit on or not? I'm not sure. <laughs> if you need more privacy, it's okay to plant a few, you know, some some Spartan junipers or some Italian cypress or something there. To, a Wichita blues or this beautiful silver blue juniper you can that grows tall and skinny, and you can have some. You can put those in now. They're slower growers. They prefer to be planted now. Now actually get more growth this year out of them by planting them before they wake up. You want to put them on so that they're setting those new. A candle growth, that new leaf bud, that new can- candle bud, the new growth, it's setting, if it's setting that while it's in the ground in your yard, it will wake up and just ignite with new growth. You get longer, stronger growth this coming spring, and those will usually start taking off in about six weeks. So sometime in March, they start to take off with growth, and they'll continue growing through about Mother's Day, and then whatever growth you have that's locked in, that's all you're going to get for the year. I mean, spruce and pine, it's once and done. Then whatever's there, it just sits there and looks at you. 
then you got to wait to the following spring to push new growth. That's why it's so important, why it's, why it's suggested that you should plant before they wake up, plant now before, I would say before the end of February, first part of March. You really want to get those in the ground. If you're out there in the yard and, and you see you need a hole, it's okay. You can do that. In fact, your garden centers you'll find are strongly uh, what they have in stock right now. They've got evergreens because they look good and they show off well. And you can merchandise those. Yeah, we've got some deciduous stuff. Yeah, we've got the maple trees. We've got we've got some other stuff, but they don't look quite as good as the evergreens do. So we we skew it towards evergreens. Whereas in another probably by the middle of February, first part of March, we're in full ship mode. We're, we're harvesting from the farms, bringing them in. And that's when the lilacs and forsythias, we want to bring those things in before they actually flower. We want to, if you wait until they start to bloom in your neighborhood, there's this pulsating wave of customers going, where are the lilacs? Where are the, I want a lilac. My neighbor's got one of these. I want one. What's this picture? Tell me what this is. I want one. Oh, it smells so good. I want one. You need to have it before they show up. So we're always trying to be a season ahead by, by about two to four weeks so that plants are acclimated to our time frame, and then they bloom on our cycle. And that's all. That's day parts. How, how long are the days? How warm is the soil? How warm is the, the nighttime temperatures? There's several variables on why things bloom when they do, and it's going to be neighborhood specific. Even more so, it'll be exposure specific. If you're on an east side, east exposure of a hill or mountainside, your plants will bloom before the north side or the west side. And so it depends on where, what, what, kind of, what kind of light you have, how warm that soil, how does it warm up faster? And so you'll see in a neighborhood, things will, those um, forsythias will bloom at different times. Oh, wow, they're two weeks, two weeks ahead of me. Why aren't mine blooming yet? Well, that's, that's why. Uh, that really plays out for crepe myrtles, rosa sharons, and the, the list goes on, uh, especially for fruit trees. If you're thinking of planting a new fruit tree, I don't know why I went off on this tangent, but plenty of fruit trees to choose from. Uh, if you're going to focus on fruit trees out in the yard for the mountains of Arizona, always start with apples and pears. They're the last ones to bloom in spring, so you're more likely to get fruit off of those. Now, the first one to bloom, they'll be in bloom by the end of end of March, first of first of April will be your apricots and nectarines. We do have really good harvest of those, uh, but but it's about every other, every third year because the frost gets them. There's still our average frost date, last frost is about the first week in May. And so if it's exposed for a month to possible frost, it can take that flower or new fruits. So you start with apples and pears, then you start to accessorize with, I would say, peaches next, then cherries, then it would be probably plums, and then it would be uh, apricots and nectarines. That's kind of the sequence. Uh, the summer blooming things, doesn't matter. So your, your grapes, they, they have no interest in spring. They wait until it's summer, till it's warm, till, the, till there's no more freezing. They'll just wait, and then they'll start to take off. Uh, your blackberries and raspberries, they don't really care. They just wake up later. They're not exposed to that early spring F potential frost. That's where it's really important, too, to do your homework. You want a variety that has a lot, a lot of chilling hours. So if you're planting a new fruit tree, good. You can do that right now. And it's an eye-opener for folks from more tropical or desert climates. You thought, oh, it's cold out. I've got to have a vest on to be able to go out and enjoy my morning walk. It, it must, I can't put it, plants are going to like this. No, certain plants, they do like this. So it's, if you're going to start, though, Start with that sequence of, of go with the apples and pears, then to your, your peaches, then cherries, then I'm trying to go through the list in my head, <laughs> then nectarines, persimmons, all these others. They all do well here. Uh, but it's, you just want to play. Also, if you're going to plant uh, something that is maybe frost sensitive, do not plant it down by that dry wash. Plant it up on a slope next to the house, further up the hill. The further up you go, the warmer it is. What happens is, it's counterintuitive, but cold air sinks and runs down these dry washes. So if it's tricked into blooming early and then a cold comes and this cold air settles down on top of it, you'll have, you'll, there'll be more fruit and, and blossom damage 
won't hurt the tree. It just takes the fruit. If you bring it up closer, my best success has been next to a lawn. Had apricots every year because I planted it next to the house, next to a lawn. And it was a semi-dwarf variety. And I just had fruit every year. People going, how do you do that? I, I, I haven't had fruit in three years. Well, I put it in the right place. I planted it where it's a little bit warmer. It's easier to protect. Lawns actually have more, whether it's a rock lawn or, or grass lawn, it doesn't matter. They throw off more heat uh, than, and they protect those plants rather than a dry wash. Everyone's got that dry creek bed going through their backyard. And they're thinking, oh, I'll plant it next to that. They'll be happier there. Actually, they won't. Evergreens, they don't care. Plant them now and they don't even think about them. They'll wake up when they want to. The secret is put them in the ground before they set, while they're, so they're setting those buds while they're in the ground for you. Then you're going to water those maybe twice a month. It's plenty to keep them going, to keep that bud growth coming. If you've got, a, if you've got an established evergreen, it is really important to fertilize them right now. Fertilize those evergreens so we can maximize that bud. Use the all-purpose, the 744 all-purpose food, and that will increase the bud growth on those evergreens, especially if they've been damaged at all. So we answered a question about uh, deer taking off my willow trees, taking the bark off. It's important to fertilize those now. Treat the wound, but then fertilize it so we get that cambium layer to grow over that wound. We'll get more growth on that top growth that shades the wound. It goes for evergreens, fruit trees, whatever. You want to increase. This is your opportunity. This sets the stage right now for how things will look in six to eight weeks. So you're fertilizing now for spring beauty. That's the insider tip I can give you on that. Be right back. We don't go anywhere. We've got more after this. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. New to the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Save natural, organic, fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. Something I'm doing, what was that, uh, Thursday, there's a little storm system came through, got just a dusting of snow up in Flagstaff, just, it, it got a little colder, it was chilly. So what I did is, especially for my container gardens, I watered everything before the storm came. I know there was moisture coming, and oh, that's, that doesn't make sense. Why would you water things when water's coming? Well, first of all, moisture in northern Arizona is very dicey at best. There's no way to measure it, and it's almost always leaves plants wanting. What's really important, I didn't want damage, cold damage, to hit my plants. So we hadn't seen moisture in two, three weeks, so things were dry. I could see my pansies were laying down a little bit. They were dry, but but still blooming, still looking good. Uh, But I thought, oh, that's an indicator. They're a little dry. I don't want those plants uh, to, after the storm clears, it gets brutally cold. So it was already cold before the storm hit. You could feel the temperature dropping. And then the storm comes. And then after it clears out, it really gets cold, typically. For most mountain gardens, that's the way it plays out. If you know that, I just want to make sure my plants are fully hydrated before the cold, before the storm gets here. If I get some some moisture in, great, that's a bonus. It just hydrates things, so they're really come they'll come out of spring, come into spring robustly. Uh, more damage is caused to 
hedgerows, and evergreens especially, the tip burn on, on evergreens, uh, your, your bud, bud damage on fruit trees, you'll lose your, your lilac buds. When the plant is dry and it gets cold, that's when the damage is done. So just, just some, here's, my name's Ken. We're just friends, neighbors talking across the back fence. This is kind of what I'm doing in my own yards. And I think if you're tuned in, at least to the higher elevations, it'll really be a game changer and make a difference in your yard as well. We go over a, a lot of these on the garden classes. So we're starting our garden class series this week. So we started with, with houseplants. Lisa was teaching the best houseplants, how to design with houseplants, what are the best varieties of houseplants. We had a huge order come in this week just to so we'd be ready for the garden class. Uh, each week we'll have that every Saturday at 9.30 in the morning. That's what we do. It's free. Just come and hang out with other gardeners. There'll be probably 30 to 40 people at a garden class. We're just hanging out, sipping coffee, talking gardening. It goes for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. It's a really energetic class. They've got a lot of questions. There's lots of interaction kind of stuff. Bring a notebook. Away we go. This week it was happy, healthy houseplants with professional style. Lisa taught that one. Next week, I've got one of my best designers. So Doug Arthur, he's one of our landscape designers. He goes out on site, helps people design. Here's what to keep. That's a weed. Take this. He'll come out and just walk around and, and then helps you sketch out some new styles. You want to place some trees. He, he does that. He's teaching uh, landscapes with flair. How do, how, do you, how do you look at a landscape through a prof professional's eye? He'll be teaching next week. That's January 18th, 9.30. And then uh, why January is the month to plant wildflowers. I think I'll teach that one. That's January 25th. And the list goes on and on. We, we try to just help folks get better at gardening in and, and, and a timely fashion. So these are the things that are a top of mind for gardeners right now in the month of January. If you want to take a look at the entire class schedule, actually not entire, we're still morphing a few, but through February, we've got them posted on our website, watersgardencenter.com. Look for the classes button just at the bottom of the page. You can't miss it. Or Facebook, if you're into Facebook, facebook.com forward slash watersgardencenter under events. They're all listed through February right there. They're all free. They're all on Saturday, every Saturday at 9 30 come. You might even come a little bit early if it's, a, it's a, if it's a popular topic. We can have standing room only. I've only got 50 chairs and then it gets, then we got to get creative, but, and then parking becomes an issue. So just, oh, head, heads up warning. So Ken and Lisa Lane, we hang out here at Waters Garden Center throughout the week. We love talking gardening with friends. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.